The HP Project and the HP Channel are supported by AudioQuest. Experience the difference. Although there are those that doubt the influence of good interlinks on the sound, they are very important if you want to preserve the audio quality your sources can deliver. That's no voodoo, but for a large part known technology and for a smaller part still uncharted territory. Let's look at the known technology. But before I go into the technology I must make clear that I have never published reviews of cables and for a good reason. Cables are an integral part of a stereo set. Interlinks form a total with the source and the amp where the output properties of the source, like a CD player or DAC, the properties of the cable and the input properties of the amp together define how well the sound is. Furthermore, environmental factors play a role as well. If you live in an apartment building in a big city, the high frequency pollution due to Wi-Fi, cell phones and so on is considerably higher than in a rural area. So the shielding of HF signals will be of more importance in the city. If your equipment causes severe earth problems, cable properties might react different on that and so on. This video therefore is not a review of cables but rather tries to explain why there are sonic differences between cables and how to select yours. As we have seen in part 1 of this series, shielding is of enormous importance. If you live in an area with a 230 volts grid, the voltage is over 40 dBs higher than the output voltage of the average CD player or DAC. Let's assume the shielding is capable of damping the signals from the outside with 90 dBs. Then the 230 volts still will be at minus 50 dBs when it arrives at the signal carrying core. That's slightly lower than a digital signal at 8 bits would produce. Let's have a look at the voltage levels of a line output of a CD player or DA converter at Redbook specs. In the left column you see a number of bits. The second column shows the number of decimal values they can code. The dBs column shows the amplitude depth in dBs and the fourth column shows you the corresponding voltages. You can see that the 16 bit represents 30 microvolts, 30 millionth of a volt. Now let's say you have a DA converter and a 20 bit recording. You now have 24 dBs more dynamic range and uh, the least significant bit now represents 1.91 microvolts. You will be hard pressed to find a converter that goes beyond this level and if you find one it will be at best offering 21 bits resolution since thermal noise is the enemy here. Therefore 24 bit recordings and 24 bit DACs will have no real purpose since the lower 4 bits will almost certainly contain no info and if they do they will not be converted properly. But back to the interconnects. As you can see the detail of the music that is hidden in the low level signal is stored at very low voltages. Therefore well made power cables will dampen the stray magnetic field to a certain level. The rest must be done by the shielding of the interconnect and by increasing the distance between the power cable and the interconnect. If there is a specification of the shielding it usually is in percentage. Unfortunately that doesn't specify the damping of the shielding but the mechanical coverage of the shield. Cables made for custom install can use solid materials for shielding, but cables for normal interconnection of equipment need to be flexible and therefore use braided wire shielding that is not able to cover the surface completely and will therefore leak a bit. Expensive cable might use conductive plastic materials, but apart from being expensive they also need more care during production. For those that now think they are better off since their grid only runs at 110 volts, you are right, but the difference with 230 volts is only 6.4 dBs due to those damned logarithmics. 
Two types of interconnects are common, single ended and symmetrical. The first usually has RCA connectors where the second uses XLR plugs. Let's look into the differences. A single ended cable is comparable with the Bowden cable as used on bikes for the brakes. On the handlebar there is a me mechanism that can pull the inner cable through the outer cable. That shortens the inner cable at the other end, activating the brakes. When the brake handle is released, a spring will pull back the inner cable. In effect, the brake movement is the difference between the inner cable and the outer cable. When you move the outer cable, sometimes the brake mechanism will be operated slightly. The balance system is comparable to the steering cables of a speedboat. From the steering wheel, two cables go to the outboard motor, one along the left side of the boat and the other on the right side. If the steering wheel is turned to one side, the cable on one side is shortened while the cable on the other side is lengthened. The difference is that here there is no room for play where the single brake cable might get stuck when dirt builds up and the spring might not be able to retract the inner cable completely. Let's go back to the interconnects. An asymmetrical connection uses the core of a cable as life and the shielding as return. So it depends on the ground potential as a reference. Where the ground potential is shifted due to a potential problems between equipment, this will influence the audio quality. Symmetrical connections use two cores for the signal, one live and one return and use the shielding only for ground. This not only makes it independent of the ground level, it also has the advantage that a stray signal that might be, have been leaked through the shielding equally reaches the live and the return core and therefore cancels out. It's like two persons pulling a steering wheel, each in the opposite direction. When they pull just as hard, the steering wheel will not turn. It might be clear that a symmetrical cable connection potentially has the advantage. However, that's only the case when the devices that are connected use symmetrical electronics as well. Often the symmetrical connection is made by adding an op amp, thus an extra amplifier stage, to create a symmetrical output and if you are really lucky the receiving side does the same. In that case using a symmetrical connection introduces two amplifier stages and there is no such thing as lossless amplification. Depending on the situation and on the equipment a single ended cable might be a better solution while in other cases the balance cable might be better. There is no right solution for all, there only is the best compromise. But even within one kind of cable the construction is of importance. A cable is built from one or two cores surrounded by an isolator called dielectric with around that the shielding. So there are two or three conductors carrying a current. Depending on the construction there will be a given resistance, impedance and capacitance. And if you are lucky or chose wisely, the manufacturer has chosen these parameters to be suited for their purpose. But if the distance between the conductors change, so will the electrical properties. If you bend the cable to be able to connect it to the amplifier and the construction is not done properly, the core or cores might be pulled closer to the inside of the bend, thus changing the electric properties of a cable. You know the doubling then at Polyhymnia Recording Studio even proved that microphony might occur, cables producing their own signal due to mechanical force applied to them. Let me make one more shocking statement. The thickness of a cable say little about the quality of the cable. Audiophiles like thick cables for they look high end. And they can be, but not per se. Good cables are done by heavy research and lots of listening. This subject is slightly less documented, at least in my research. But I see causal connections so I'll mention it anyway. Many manufacturers claim that oxygen in between the crystals of a conductor can and will cause oxidation, covering the crystals with an oxide that has less linear properties than desired. Two metals are well suited as conductor, pure silver and pure copper. 
Pure silver is sparingly used due to its price. Usually the silver used for jewellery is also used for audio cables and here the silver is an alloy to make it more durable with jewellery and more affordable with cables. For audio the added metals often make the cable sound harsh or sharp. Even pure silver cables might sound somewhat harsh due to the silver oxide in between the crystals. Therefore oxygen free silver, gold doped silver or even monocrystal silver might be used to prevent the oxide. In essence the same goes for copper. Copper while still not being cheap is a lot cheaper than silver and oxygen free copper has been around for half a century now. There are even monocrystal copper cables. Again, the purity of the metal used seems to be of great importance. Another factor that seems to be universally shared between cable manufacturers is the use of a single solid core. As with anything nowadays, the marketing BS and the real fact are hard to distinguish from each other. Every manufacturer knows that giving the consumer a number of handles to hold on to does improve sales. The louder you shout that your product washes whiter, is more green or less damaging, the more you sell, as Volkswagen has shown painfully clear. But even when comparing cables of standing reputation, be aware that the, inter the interaction with, with your equipment might be a factor. When you compare cables and one cable sounds clearly brighter than the others, you will have to find out whether that cable is just better or only emphasizing the highs and so on. Stereo clubs are a fine place to exchange not only information but also products. If one of the club members had bought a new product, you might want to listen to that and you might even convince him to try it out at your home too. As you have seen, cable manufacturer AudioQuest has sponsored this video, for which I am grateful. I like to stress that they did not have or wanted to have any influence on the editorial of this video. No sponsor can have that influence. Not out of principle, but simply because I can't work like that. That makes the sponsors Hi-Fi Clubben, AudioQuest and S-Booster even more commendable. Something I would like to mention in this last video of 2016. Next year I will continue the audio hygiene series and other videos in this rather higher video quality. So if you want to stay informed, subscribe to this channel or follow me on Twitter, Facebook or Google+. If you have questions, please post them below this video but don't ask me for buying advice. View my about questions video to find out why. You find more informa information below this video and if you like this video please consider supporting the channel through Patreon and tell your friends on the web about it. I am Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you in the next show or on the HBproject.com. And whatever you do, enjoy the music. <laughs>